Film Festival panel on the Red Pill. We are excited to have Tanya Pinkins and Arthur Jaffa with us today. And we're going to talk about the Red Pill and explore uh, everything about it. So I'll start off first. Arthur and Tanya, either one of you could take the question at a time. The cinematography in the opening scenes where the friends are traveling on the road with the fall colors, it was just breathtaking. We don't get that on the West Coast. <laughs> it drew me in and it made me remember going on field trips with my friends. It really did set the stage. Um, tell me about the process and how you chose Virginia as a backdrop. Well, um, the foliage is always a big, big thing in America, the fall foliage. And so I, I felt like this is a story that's a very American story. And um, I wanted to uh, capture that beauty of America in the fall, which is when election season happens. So we, we hired a drone photographer. And I also wanted us to listen to the conversation. I feel like we've been doing so much texting and emailing and tweeting. And now that there's apps like Clubhouse, our ears are getting more acclimated to hearing people again. And so it was really important to me to have something very beautiful as I um, require the audience to listen to what I think is an important conversation. It was breathtaking. And Arthur? Uh, well, <laughs> I assumed <laughs> it was a drone shot. I wasn't there, but uh, obviously, but uh, I, um, um, you know, it sort of, um, it evoked, you know, the kinds of things like I think I would associate that like with The Shining has those mm -hmm. sort of incredible sort of landscape shots like in the beginning, you know, set, set in this sort of thing. I mean, the thing is, is when it comes to Black people and uh, what I would call the pastoral, there's a kind of inherent tension between those two things already because the pastoral environment is an environment where if we, you know, we automatically think of white people in it. And if we think of black people in it, it always sort of evokes the kind of what I call a fear of deliverance, you know, mm -hmm. so this whole <laughs> idea that black people need to stay on the lighted corner. They need to That's stay right. in the urban areas and stuff. <laughs> as soon as we step off, we're going to be confronted with what America really looks like when the cameras aren't on. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a, you know, it kind of evokes that. So I, I kind of kind of got the dual sort of thing that I think it was sort of. And that Deliverance was my model. I was literally modeling the opening of Deliverance and them driving into that that little town. Yeah. OK, that's what I felt. <laughs> OK, I got it. <laughs> well, Tanya, uh, tell us what brought you to the horror genre? I just love horror. I probably watch okay. two or three a day. I watch them before I go to bed. Um, I feel like that's the genre where you can talk about things that people don't really want to talk about. Mm -hmm. And I have, I think, something like, you know, where I feel like maybe it's something that just people of color or oppressed people have, where we have to know what's going to happen because our life depends on it. And I mm -hmm. find a lot of times when I tell people like, it was obvious who was going to win in 2016 and people treated me with such contempt. And when I, you know, had my sense about what was going to happen this time, it was like, forget even talking about it. Why don't you just make a story about how you see this playing out? Cause nobody's going to listen to you. <laughs> but they do. And they will now. <laughs> um, Listen, Tanya, in the movie, Cassandra had strong feelings or premonitions. Black women can relate to that. You know, we know red flags, spidey sense, follow your first mind. Uh, we see ourselves in your face and your reactions on the film. Did you draw on anything personal? It, it's all personal. I mean, for me, this was a movie for Black women. Like, we are so used to knowing and telling and everybody ignoring us and telling us, oh, you're just a little crazy. Oh, you're so sensitive. Oh, mm -hmm. get over it. And so, yes, that is exactly what it is for me. This is like how we as Black women, we see, we know, and because of the genre that it's in without giving anything away, it's like, we got to follow our instincts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I know. You kept looking over your shoulder throughout the movie. <laughs> um, you know what, There, the hanging noose in the beginning of the film was important. It let the audience know that you're going to expect a little bit more from this film than you thought you were going to get. Uh, what kind of thinking went into that, to staging that and placing that exactly where you have it in the film? That was a scary moment for me. 
um, to even to even do that because I know it's taboo. And even in our press about the movie, um, every press place that we sent the photo with the noose, they removed it. Wow. Um, it is such a huge part of American, a black American history mm-hmm. that um, because to me, this is a movie about what we as black people experience in America. I felt that that symbol was important. And then you see it on January 6th. They let them build a gallows and you on the it. mall. And you believe it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, is like, as soon as you go to a horror film, I mean, I think there's an inherent tension as soon as you place a black person in any kind of horror movie, because like deep down, everybody knows that fundamentally, like our actual real history is a horror story. I mean, it's not a fiction. It's like, it's, it's like real. It's, this stuff is real. Like, you know, like for example, the sort of uh, assault on the Capitol. Like we know if black people had even nodded in that direction, it would have been a massacre on the steps. And like, you actually have people like, like you said, like, having a, a gallow on it and breaking in and all this kind of stuff. It's like, what's more horrifying that they did it or that everybody is responding like, like they're not responding like what's in front of us. That like, it's treason. It's like straight up treason. treason. And nobody would even use the word. They won't even use the word. Even the Democrats who hate Trump won't straight up use the word. It's straight up treason. Obama would be in jail now. If he had done anything remotely like this, oh. he'd be sitting in jail. And so like the horror is not just a horror of what's happening, but the sense that like when this shit happens, it's normalized for them. Like we're supposed to, you know, you know, like like whenever you see it, like I think of like a film, like for example, Alien, which is a great horror film. As soon as you introduce your fat Kodo into it, it de facto becomes a discourse on how black people, quote unquote, are gonna keep it real in the face of how quote unquote, black, white people operate inside of certain structures of delusion, you know? Um, And so you can't, it's almost like you can't really make a horror film with a black person in it, where that's not the implication. It just is always a question of like, to what degree you pursue this idea to is, you know, uh, its final, final conclusion. So, or do you, you know, you sort of just bail, bail, Sorry, you bail on it, um, you know. So, so I was I was super aware of the kind of I guess I would say the meta dimension in the film the whole time I'm watching it happen, but I'm also watching the rhetorical. You know, there's a rhetorical dimension with like you know because you even see memes now. Like I just recently saw a meme. It's like the oldest joke. Like horror films wouldn't exist as their structure if black people would be in it because from the beginning, black people, you know, I just saw one of the day, they, they come into a house and the, the the photo on the wall moves a little bit and they just turn around and leave. <laughs> you know, they don't never check in. It's just like, yo, we got enough craziness. We're not looking for craziness. So. No, that was like Rochester on the Charlie Tan. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> feet don't fail me now <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, yeah and that's like for me also like what is scary to black people and what is scary to white people even in the horror genre is very different like white people want to see some great kills for me and for many of the you know people of color who have looked at the film the scary shit for them is when nothing is happening like people are acting all normal and it's like no some shit is getting ready to go down all of this <laughs> calmness and shit that's the tense part <laughs> Because mm-hmm, when the blood and guts happens, it's over with. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. You know, I noticed there's a lot of attention to detail. And even putting Nick in a dashiki. <laughs> 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 How did you decide to do that? Um, you know, there's so much performative allyship and performative wokeness. And so... Um, and I don't think that people who do that see themselves that way. And mm-hmm. so this was my opportunity because I, I was like, no studio would, would let you get away with that. Like, because I, this is an indie, I could put an, I, I could be the black gaze on white performative allyship. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, knowing what we know now about the overt extent of racism and the political intersections in the movies were just spot on. 
you showed that there is no cookie cutter definition of progressive liberals or conservatives and that there's always shades of gray was that one of the messages and do you have other messages that was important to me because i just don't think any of us are are good or bad or black or white and so um i felt like i want to show that even on this quote the blue side are y'all really the good guys are you really the good guys you know you're, you're sitting in judgment of other people's values you, you know, who, who's really the good guys here? And um, I think always for me in storytelling, I feel like both, both sides have to be equal because that's what life is like. And then, and then each person who's watching it has to decide for themselves. Like, well, who was right? Who was wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, that was important to me that um, there was no clear good guys or bad guys. And you know, back to Nick again, I think that the black people or the Latin people, the Asian people, we're always the fool. And uh, I, you know, that's a, that's a flip that, you know, he's the fool in this story. Hmm. That's true. It did come through. <laughs> Definitely did. Okay. Um, you know, Tanya, you have a, a stellar body of work from stage to screen and beyond. I used to watch you on the soap opera. Sorry that they didn't treat you better. But I said, <laughs> oh, those cheekbones. I can just have those cheekbones. <laughs> uh, tell, and I know that you're about to do something with um, a show that's on now. I forget the name of it. Let me see if I put it in my notes. Oh, Women Run the World. Oh, Run oh. the World. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're still working. I, um, but this try after this trifecta of writing acting and producing what's next well i'm currently in mississippi filming women of the movement which okay. is a new abc anthology series that hopefully is successful enough that every season there will be a new black woman of the civil rights movement so this season we're doing emmett till's murder and we are down in mississippi where it happened and i'm playing his grandmother alma carthen so I think the hope is that every season ABC will do another woman of the movement. For me, in terms of storytelling, I loved getting to tell my own story. I just, I had never seen um, a story told from a black woman's point of view that way. And uh, I hope to get to do that more. I mean, I have other scripts that are this, this very unique point of view that we as black women have where we're running things, we are we're being punished as much but we get no credit we get no sympathy we get no respect uh yeah wow. like when is stacy abrams going to be the secretary of state you know that would be perfect <laughs> that would be perfect <laughs> well arthur let me ask you you know you've spent a lot of your life documenting um our lives you know documenting the history that we're living now uh What's on what's on the air forefront? <laughs> uh, I mean, a lot. <laughs> uh, spill, spill the tea. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, I uh, I'm continuing with my art career, which sort of is, I guess, like five years in the sort of blooming, so to speak. I mean, obviously, I spent years and years and years thinking about art, but obviously it's been in, only in the last maybe five years or six years that I've sort of been operating in the art world. And um, in a strange kind of way, like somewhat paradoxically, it's like the move away from like film, so to speak, has also led me back to it because it sort of put me in a position to do some things that are sort of, you know, I've thought about for a long time. So. You know, I have a film company, a new film company, um, partnering with uh, Melinda Nugent and Gavin Brown, who was my art dealer, and uh, and Maya uh, Hoffman called Sunhouse, and you know, so we're really excited about about that. And you know, I mean, we're just in development on things. Uh, you know, we're not rushing to shoot anything, but we're just slowly, you know, trying to develop some projects that we feel good about. But. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, this, you know, this is this is a really incredible moment to do uh, what I would term independent minded film, because even when people say independent films, I'm like, what do you really mean? Because 
nobody out here is independently wealthy to the point where they can finance films themselves. It's always a process of figuring out how to get the resources and stuff. But because mm -hmm. it's such a volatile moment, like a lot of people see the chaos in the industry right now as like a bad thing, but not for us because, you know, if you're outside of something, when the shit gets unstable, the way it is unstable now, like people don't know, are we ever going to have a theatrical, you know, context for movies again? Is it ever going to be collectively social again? People could say they know, but nobody really knows, you know, is, is our movies going to just be television from this point onward? So nobody really knows, but I find like, this is the best time for us to actually try to push the envelope, so to speak. Um, and it, you know, in the moments that it's like, say for example, the last sort of two big sort of explosions of like uh, black people in film would be, of course, originally would be like black exploitation moment. And that was a moment where like the sort of societal changes of the sixties and stuff had so disrupted Hollywood's relationship to the kind of movies that were being made. Like Hollywood was making Dr. Doolittle and stuff like that. And then, American independent filmmakers were doing things like, uh, you know, Easy Rider and Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song or Billy, you know, Billy Jack. It couldn't have been more divergent. It was just like almost a generation gap happened. And then like, uh, next time I think we'll be like, you know, with the emergence of like Spike in the early eighties and stuff. And so much of that also came at a moment where you were seeing these corporate takeovers of independent film studios and stuff. And so it's just, you know, there's always these moments of volatility and there's never been a moment more volatile than this one because it's not just, you know, Black Lives Matter. It's not just the sort of, you know, persistent murder of Black people and the sort of video documentation of it. It's COVID. It's like, you know, uh, like the Sony hacks, uh, Me Too, all these things are happening at the same time. So I see this as like a moment of like, you know, unprecedented opportunity. And like a moment when black people really should pursue their own, relatively speaking, unmediated visions, you know, as opposed to trying to just think inside of like, how to make a black face version of what they do. I mean, the further we can push it to being a unique perspective, as Tanya was saying in the beginning, the better I think it's gonna be for everybody, so. Yeah, Tanya, you did push it. I mean, you gave us something that was entertaining and yet, you know, when you walk away from it, you're still thinking about it. Now, to me, that's what makes a good movie, makes a good film. And um, the the music was important too. You know, I was I found myself humming "Turn Me Around" for <laughs> the mm. rest of the day. Right. <laughs> how did you um, How did you choose the music? How did you um, decide that? You know, it's this very fine line when you want to be in a genre that is you know horror is there's so many kinds of horror and uh, my daughter and i love horror the kind of horror she likes i don't like she's happy if a bunch of people are screaming and being chased and for me i need to think about something and i need to be trying to figure something out and so i had ruben blades you know he's an international singer recording artist and i said ruben you know i want them to be singing a song together uh in this movie is there something you've written that you you'd like and um he said, you know, I separate my singing and my acting career. Those are different things. He said, this should be a song that like, it, that is like a, a folk song that everybody knows. And immediately, you know, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around is what came to me. And then I set what I wanted each of the lyrics of that to be because um, we as black people have not let them turn us around and we aren't going to let them turn us around. We're going to keep on walking until we get to freedom, which we still haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. You know, there was a, a moment when they were all at the table and I think one of the actresses while they were singing was saying that, um, w women's misogyny, turn it around. You know, it was that awkward moment where that always seems to happen when you're in a group of diverse friends, someone, <laughs> We'll just go that extra mile and get a you know a little bit awkward, so that was that was a great time. Um, Tanya, I understand also that you have a podcast. I do. How or where can we find it and to watch or listen? Uh, my podcast is on the Broadway Podcast Network, which is bpn.fm forward slash ycst for you can't say that. 
Wow. Um, um, and I've done a whole series of the red pilling of America. The movie's called Red Pill because red pill in the matrix has one meaning, but when you go into the manosphere and the Reddit websites, you find that it has a whole nother meaning. And I think in this moment, particularly January 6th, we got to see that America has been red pilled. Like the, the, the enemy is actually running the show. And so, you know, that's to me what I was, was playing with in the telling of this story is that the enemy is within your midst. You don't actually know who to trust. And uh, the Democrats, what do we do? What do we do? We had this opportunity and instead of sending a message of no, we're stomping this out. We, we essentially did what Lincoln did. We said, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. Go home with your dignity, which just emboldens them that, yeah, yeah, we're going to rise again because it's ours to have. And I was reading the Look Magazine article from J.W. Milam uh, talking about the murder of Emmett Till. And they, you know, they were paid $4,000 in 1956 to confess because they knew they couldn't be tried again. And, and what he said was, nobody ever asked me if I did it. And so I knew that everyone in the community, every white person, they knew I did it and they approved of me doing it. So I was never even worried that I would be convicted. And I feel like we just saw that happen again. Mm -hmm. Trump told me to do it. Yeah. yeah, we did. We did. Well, Arthur, um, the body of your work, too, as you've been documenting things, where do you see us going? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I can't answer. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not quite <laughs> sure where I'm going most of the time. Um, you know. I don't know. I mean, I don't, it's kind of like when Trump was elected and so many of my friends are like running around. Ah, it's so horrible. And I'm just like, really? Okay. I'm not sure how this is so fundamentally different. You know, I just never thought black folks were shook by it. I don't think they were shook by Trump being elected nor surprised. Um, I mean, I do feel like there was a moment and I know like uh, Brother Cornell West took a lot of heat during Obama's administration because he was one of the few people who seemed to be, you know, willing to offer some critique of the administration. And I felt like that was a moment where, in some ways, Black people's, um, the way we like historically speaking have been the community of like keeping it real, like in a sense, you know, when people want to celebrate in this. I do feel like we sort of backed off of our sort of, you know, I, like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to call it necessarily moral authority, but there was a certain authority the black community had just around the keeping it real thing. And I think a lot of that was dissipated doing, you know, Obama's presidency because he's smart, he's handsome, he's stylish. He's not insane, like Trump is insane. But you know, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's like it's a hard, it's a hard one for me to say, like, oh, what's gonna happen in the future? Where are we going? I, I don't, I don't actually don't. I know where I'm trying to go myself, but I do think black people are gonna um, are not we're not like sort of reactive in a certain kind of way. I mean, in some ways we're not reactive enough, but I think we aren't reactive because we know this is an environment where that overreacts to how we react. So like I saw Dave Chappelle the other day was just saying like, you know, people rust up on the Capitol and stuff and they think it's gonna change something. He said, but black people know that won't change anything or else we would have tried it in the several hundred years that we've been here. We would have tried to raise the White House. And we know that's not gonna fundamentally change anything like putting this president or that president in that particular office is not gonna fundamentally change anything. If it would have, we would have seen more significant changes when Obama was in office, but it didn't fundamentally change. I mean, like people act like Black Lives Matter came up under Trump. It didn't, it came up on eight years of a black American president. So that just shows you, yeah, maybe one person is not as bad or better than another person, but fundamentally the structure of this thing is what we kind of contended with, not the person who happens to be sitting in the seat, you know, one year or another year. So we don't, we, I mean, I think we kind of fundamentally know that it's nice to be invited to the White House and have parties and have a good, you know, good musical performance and stuff, but like, you know, at the end of the day, it's really not changing, like the status, the real fundamental status of Black people and what is 
unequivocally a white supremacist environment. Like people don't want to say that, you know, and they think it's like about, oh, if you say somebody is a racist or a white supremacist, you're saying they're a bad person, <laughs> you know, as opposed to no, it just has to do with like, what's your relationship to the structure that's inherent and that permeates everything. I mean, we're never going to make any real fundamental change in America unless we have our own sort of equivalent of truth and reconciliation on some level. And we're not even beginning to be able to approach that. We can't approach truth, but yeah, exactly. reconciliation. We can't even tell yeah. truth. You can't have no reconciliation unless you have truth. And we've never gotten to that. So, you know, so given that it's just business as usual, we just will keep on keeping on in the meantime and trying to, you know, take a step forward. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back, but you know, it's, it's just about just continuing to show, like they say, La Luda Continuum. It's no, it's no like we're going to get there. It's just a constant uh, process of trying to move forward, trying one way, trying another way. I don't, I personally don't buy into like big global principles of what's going to emancipate us. I think, you know, we just keep, 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 keep it on. I mean, if nothing else, the Black community has demonstrated our ability to survive almost anything. So yes. that's our superpower. That is our superpower. Yeah. Been there, done that, survived it, thrived through it, rose again, yeah. gonna keep on rising. The struggle, yeah. the struggle continues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one thing Trump did though, he, he really opened our eyes to how big white supremacy was. You know, we may have thought that there were just these little cliques. And of course we understood institutionalized racism. But the amount of people that were able to gather in mass and come out of the woods the, in the same type of a community that the, the Red Pill was filmed in, just come out. And sure, they probably backed up back into the woods a little bit now, but they're still there. But now we know that there's maybe 70 million of them out there. Oh, I, I, I didn't feel that that was surprising. And in fact, I felt like the people who showed up at the insurrection, those are just the cannon fodder. The people who are running it, who financed it, who played for those private jets in those hotels, those are the ones we need to worry about. There's billions of dollars behind that movement. And yeah, I'm not surprised at how many there are. And then we have this algorithm thing that's connecting people who uh, around just stinking thinking. That's really the only thing I can say about it. And I'm like, we have to figure out how to address people who are actually thinking in ways that do not match science and reality. Like how do we, um, how do we move them forward for the sake of the whole of the world? Because they're armed and they, 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 their belief is very strong and their faith is very strong and we cannot ignore them. That's true. Well, Tanya, yeah. you know, you've had a, um, you know, social justice isn't something that's new for you. Can you tell us what you've been doing? Because I, I know that it's all been important. So just share with us. Uh, you know, it's really for me just showing up in the moment and responding to whatever moment is is necessary. I worked for a couple of years with Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw and her Breaking the Silence summer camp where I got to spend time with women whose uh, daughters or sisters had been murdered by the police. People don't talk about the fact that black women are killed by the police as often as black men and we are often killed in our home. And so uh, working on that project and the Say Her Name project, I also just as an, as an actor, I, um, I just always speak up if there's a wrong being done. I don't, uh, I don't think there's any, um, there's no amount of money you can pay me <laughs> to go along with something that's wrong. So yes, that's gotten me, you know, people don't want to hire me, but at the same time, there are people who respect me because I'm willing to put my pocketbook on the line. And this past year, there was a lot of performative activism around George Floyd's death with every organization saying Black Lives Matter. And, I was just very clear and wrote a very long essay on Medium about why I'm fed up with performative activism from both black and white uh, artists. Because if you weren't saying it before George Floyd was murdered, then I don't believe it today. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is not new, you know? 
Hmm. Okay, well, what, um, what film uh, impacted you the most as you were growing up or in your adult life or, or to this point? Gosh, I've watched so many movies impacted me the most. Um, mm, that is a hard, hard call. Because um, my taste is so varied. I would probably say uh, Seven Beauties, Lena Werkmuller. Um, okay. Because I, you know, I, I would say in making Red Pill, I was trying to find humor in this very dark thing. And Lena Wertmiller very much did that in, in showing you, you know, um, fascism in Italy and, and finding all the humorous moments in a really horrible, horrible situation. So uh, I've always been an admirer of her in that movie. Okay. And, and for you, Arthur, tell me something that really impacted you, whether it's film or artwork or cinema, cinematography. <laughs> That's funny, then. I was like, you make the distinction between film and cinema. I said, film or artwork or cinema. <laughs> well. uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, look, I'm kind of on record. The thing that had the biggest single impact on me was definitely 2001, A Space Odyssey. Mm. Uh, but I don't think like necessarily the things that have the biggest impact on you are necessarily the best films or even the films that you want to emulate as a filmmaker, like things like so many things, and the Incredible Shrinking Man freaked me out. Like when I was a kid, uh, like to this day, it's like when it, you know, it was bad enough that he was, you know, lost in the flood in the basement when the washing machine flooded, and he, you know, was fighting spiders and all this kind of yeah. stuff. But the most frightening aspect of the movie is at the very end where it said he shrunk till he was nothing. This sort of existential horror of that, like completely freaked me out when I was, you know, four or five years old watching that thing. But, you know, Island of the Mushroom People, <laughs> you know, oh like at the end of the film, like the guy was recounting in flashback this experience he had when their boat became stranded on this island where there were these mushroom people, like monsters, with they were like horrible leprosy kind of people. And in the end, he is the only one who escapes and he talks about being trapped at sea and he says, I was at sea for like whatever, so many weeks, and there was nothing left to eat. But the mushrooms, and then he looks into the camera with a light and says, and I ate them, and he has the mushroom <laughs> stuff all over his face. You know? So I don't know if that classifies as great cinema, but it had a profound impact on me. When I saw Citizen Kane years later, I was like, oh, I've seen this flashback structure before in Island of the Mushroom People. It wasn't really Citizen Kane where I sort of was so a film structured all in flashback. You know, Fellini movies, because I didn't understand why everybody was talking like, we don't, we don't, you know, we're talking <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Had a big impact on me, so, yeah. Well, you know what, as we start to wrap it up, um, I want to ask each of you, and I'll start with you, Tanya, what advice would you give to someone who's starting this path, someone that might be watching, and, um, you know, a hurdle that you were able to overcome, or just some advice? I truly believe that if it was put on your heart, and you have a strong desire, that it's for you to do, and that everything that comes in your path, every no, every obstacle, is just about sharpening you so that you can do that thing that was put on your heart to do. I know that sounds, you know, it's a discipline I have that I bless my obstacles. Um, in my, my journey to path video, I said, the no's were what got me to making a movie. I mean, I know a lot of people in this business. I've shadowed, you know, on a lot of big TV shows. I have relationships where I've asked people to let me direct and they all said no. And because they all said no, I was like, well, I'm going to say yes to myself and I'm going to give myself the opportunity. The technology has gotten to the point now where you can shoot 4K on a phone. You can tell a story, whatever story you, you want to tell. You can put it on the internet. You can put it on the VOD sites. There is nothing to stop you from telling a story right now. And I feel like we all have to decolonize our minds. And that includes white people because, you know, white supremacy don't care about white people either. 
when they let all them people get shot in Las Vegas and nothing happened, it was like a white supremacy don't care about white people either. So we all have to decolonize our minds and, and, and start to tell the stories that maybe nobody else, we think nobody else has experienced it that way or seen it that way. But getting to build a world was the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. And I failed again and again and again. And every failure was worth it. And people telling me I couldn't and I didn't, it, it was worth it because what I realized is that men have been building worlds since film began. And nobody told them your world is wrong. They just got to build a world and we had to go along on the ride if we wanted to. And so that was the opportunity that making this film gave me. I got to build a world. And if someone said, well, I don't like that or that's not wrong, it's like, okay. But this is an opportunity for you to go on a journey inside my eyes. And if you want to see it that way, you can build a world and show me that. But there's nothing wrong about this world. It's the world I see and I wanted to build. So do it. Just do it. Okay. Well, now, did you see any difference from the obstacles of being a woman in this business and the obstacles of being Black? Or is there a third category, the obstacles of being a Black woman? I think that, you know, we're back into intersectionality. Certainly people just wouldn't do some of the men that I was working with just wouldn't do what I asked them to do. I mean, my editing process took way longer than it ever should have taken because the men just wouldn't do what I asked them to do. They wouldn't take my notes. They wouldn't do what I wanted them to do. And I, I happened to have a friend who said, you only get to make your first film once doesn't matter if it's good or bad, it's yours and you only get to make the first one one time, make sure it's everything you want it to be. So, um, you know, nine months into the editing process, I said, okay, it's gotta be a woman. And I ended up going to Seoul, Korea to work with a South Korean woman to cut the film. And even my composer is from Greece. We found that a lot of times just Americans didn't want to tell this story <laughs> and people outside of the country, they just got it. It was like, oh, this makes sense to me. And Americans are like, whoa, what are you saying? Uh -huh. So um, yeah, that, that I felt like the thing that black women, as a black woman, we get to tell is besides the indigenous people, we have less wealth than anybody in this country. And we are at the bottom of, um, we're at the bottom of the American world. I mean, even the, the indigenous people have reservations and they get money from the government. Um, I wanted to be able to tell a story through my eyes that I was clear that other black women would relate to, even when lots of people were telling me, I don't, I don't like that, that doesn't make sense. And I was like, okay, well, now you know what my life is all day, every day. People don't like what I have to say. They don't think I'm making any sense, even though I know exactly what is about to happen. It made a lot of sense, trust, it did. Mm. Well, Arthur, let me switch over to you and ask you what advice you would have for someone who wanted to pursue all of the fields of endeavors <laughs> that you have. I mean, I would just echo Tanya. It's just, you know, pursue your bliss. Um, understand, uh, even though we can't accept other people's definitions of us, sometimes shit's just not meant for you, you know? And it's a discipline. I mean, I find with myself, I'm constantly telling my son, you know, it's easy to be like, you know, you know, what's not meant for you is not meant for you when it's something that, you know, you sort of only vaguely want. It's hard to, to stay in that discipline when, um, when it's something you really want. But, you know, I guess I'm just very much my mother's son in that respect. It's like, you know, you just, the door closes and another door opens. You know, I've, I've seldom at the, at the age I'm at now, I have to say I've, sell, I've often gotten things, didn't get things that I wanted, but at the end of the day, I've seldom not gotten things that I needed. So I just, I just try to trust that. And if one door doesn't seem to be opening, then I just accept, you know, once I've given it my due diligence, I accept that it's not the door I should be going through. I should be going through another door. So. Well, what forward. kind of obstacles have you experienced as a black man in this industry? 
<laughs> you got another you got another two or three hours <laughs> yeah i mean i don't know I well, mean, something that I, could I, help our, our, our audience you know i don't know if it would help people because on one level like the things that sort of you know that i think have been hurdles for me you know this thing changes it evolves all the time so you know i mean i think everybody knows that sometimes it's not so much um, somebody's out here with a stick stopping you from doing something sometimes it's more like they don't give you the benefit of a doubt for doing something like even before we did daughters of the dust like with julie dash everybody kept telling us that there was no audience for it you know like i mean i never forget this note we got from one of the huge funding agencies was saying something like, well, what about the farm in, the farm in Idaho? Like, okay, you know, when they make The Shining, ain't nobody saying, well, what about the little black girl in Brooklyn? Nobody's saying that, you know? So, um, but, you know, you kind of, you push through them saying there's no audience for it, and then it's a hit. And then they say it was a fluke, you know? So it's just like, you know, I like to say we're never we're we're never the right brothers and sisters like you know we already we always the wrong brothers and sisters like you know if we push something over a cliff and it glides for 100 200 feet you know they just say it was very windy that day but if a white guy does it they say let's invest millions of dollars in it because we can see the implications of it it could be an airplane that could fly a mile and then 10 miles and 100 miles and a thousand miles but we're never given that benefit of the doubt, you know? So I don't know. Wow. Okay, that's some very good advice from both of you. You know, I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, since this panel is about the red pill, <laughs> I wanna uh, go on back to it and talk to you, Tanya, about hmm, the different messages. Okay, and was it your goal to, I mean, because they came through, was it your goal to not only tell a story, but to also make people think have, with these messages? That's always my goal, but I know that we're not in a society or a time when people want to think. It's like, you got to have a sound bite, you got to have this. And so, um, you know, when I was interviewing my editors, I had a, I interviewed a German editor, an Armenian editor, an African American editor, and a South Korean editor, and it was just, I think that I create in whatever medium, whether I'm acting or writing or directing, I'm trying to communicate with people. I want you to know what I'm thinking, what I'm experiencing, and then I want you to tell me what you're thinking and experiencing because. I know there's no objective world. There's just the world of our experience. And so I'm like, here's what I'm experiencing. I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. What do you get? So there are so many layers of messages in that thing. I mean, there could be academic papers written <laughs> on, mm. I've given you the history of the political parties in there without ever saying a word. <laughs> <laughs> you know, will people get that on a symbolic level because you've been living it? But, you know, there's a level in which I've given you that entire history without ever having a word said about it. And uh, I think that, you know, Ar Arthur saying that we go on, like that's to me the message of the movie. Like, yeah, this is what we're living with and we keep going on. And, and we keep going on with humor and we keep going on, even though this is what we're living in, but trust your instinct. <laughs> <laughs> Trust <the> instinct. <laughs> well, Tony, can you tell me, or at least tell the audience, uh, when they could see the red pill, where they could see it? They can see it at the Pan African Film Festival. That's we are I'm having about. our premiere at the Pan African Film Festival, and you can get your tickets at www.paff.org. Well, listen, I want to thank both of you for this interview. I mean, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. And I just, you. I just celebrate your talent. And I'm so glad that the Pan-African Film Festival is able to share the, all the good works that you both have done. So thank you very much. Wish both of you much success. Okay. Bless you, Kathy. I really appreciate you and the time you took to watch it and to be so insightful about it. I really appreciate you. And thank you, Arthur, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to come and uh, 
and, and help me. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Okay, this is a wrap up. This is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President for the African American Film Critics Association. Oh, wait. Are we waving? So it's Pan Pan African Film Festival. Okay. Yes. Okay. One, two, three, four, uh, five. And one second for me. Let me do and you're I'm sorry I'm sorry I, oh you're I, good I couldn't, sir I couldn't hear I couldn't hear the cue because it went like out it went so. right out uh, okay uh five four three two one uh hey this is uh, AJ Arthur Jafer and I'm super excited to be participating with the Pan-African Film Festival 2021 edition. Uh, it's exciting and I'm happy to be down with it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I messed that up. Can I try that again? Yes, sir. Pick up whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, hey, this is uh, AJ Arthur Jafer. I'm really excited to be participating with the 2021 Pan African uh, Film Festival. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so do you mind just doing one more and, and seeing uh, your like your title? So uh, um, Arthur, Jeff, and your, your, your title or profession and, and then uh, doing it. Is that okay? Uh, uh, like my title, like professor or something? Filmmaker, like, artist, oh, uh, cinematographer. Uh, something, something of the lines like what you do or whatever whatever you do which we know but I'm also like, like you're okay. here like you're here with tanya pinkin um okay something like that okay you guys are gonna have to give me a script the next time i'm like mm, okay got it so tell me when i should go whenever you're ready sir okay uh, this is Arthur J. I'm a filmmaker, and I'm here having a conversation with the incredible Tanya Pinkins uh, to, uh, in support of uh, her film screening at the 2021 uh, edition of the Pan-African Film Festival. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. 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 Uh, thank Thank you, Mr. Arthur. And now we'll go to Miss Tanya and get her drop and give me just a second. Okay, I'm gonna bounce. I'll talk to you later, Tanya, okay? Thanks, AJ. Okay, no problem, bye-bye. Thank you, sir, bye-bye. Okay, and now Miss Tanya, um, again, if you can just say your name and give a little drop for us as well, and I'll count you down. Let me, let me just ask a question. Do you want a drop for the panel or a drop for the festival or both? Uh, we would like both if you if you're okay, okay with that. Okay, let me do both then. All right. Okay, perfect. I'll do two and in a row. Okay, and you can start when you're ready. Hi, my name is Tanya Pinkins, and I'm excited to participate in this panel with Kathy Williamson of the African American Critics Association. Oops, look back, because you're the vice president, right? You're not just the of the Kathy Williamson. Okay, I'm going back. Here we go. Hi. My name is Tanya Pinkins, and I'm excited to participate in this program, The Red Pilling of America, with the Vice President of the African American Critics Association, Kathy Williamson, and with the brilliant cinematographer, visual artist, Arthur Jaffa. I'm here with my film at PATH, Red Pill. The festival is February 28th through March 14th. Get your tickets now. Tanya, that was perfect, except for you. Say, say Pan African Film Festival. Gotcha. Because most we people go don't know yeah. what PATH is. Okay. Yeah, but that's perfect. Okay. okay. Hi, my name is Tanya Pinkins, and I am ecstatic to premiere my debut feature, Red Pill, at the Pan African Film Festival and to participate in this panel with the Vice President of the African American Critics Association, Kathy Williamson, and the brilliant cinematographer, visual artist, Arthur Jaffa. Get your tickets February 28th through March 14th for the Pan-African Film Festival. Perfect. What do you think, Melissa? You want one Brilliant. more that's shorter? That's just the festival without the panel? That would be um, great. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> 
Hi, my name is Tanya Pinkins, and I am so honored to premiere Red Pill at the Pan African Film Festival, which is February 28th to March 14th, 2021. Get your tickets at paff.org. Perfect. You should have yes. been a director or an actor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm I'm still hope I'll break in before I die. You know, maybe I got a few more years left. Kathy, you were just it was such an honor. I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. But I feel the Thank same you, way. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Tanya. I'm so Thank excited you, to Melissa. see your phone based on this conversation. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank good. you, Miss Linda. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. I love you, love you, love you. Thank you All right. so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. And Miss Kathy, we'll keep you. Okay. Okay. Okay, Miss Kathy. Um, so we need to do a couple of things with you, if that's okay, if you have a moment. Um, we want to go ahead and get your intro again for the panel. And if you could um, introduce the participants as well. So um, just maybe say their name and title, that would be great. Um, so we'll get that one more time clean from you. And then we'll do um, some drops from you as well. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, Actress, perfect. I want to make sure I have it all. Actress, uh, producer, and director. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Got it. Okay. All right, cinematographer. Okay. And so I'll let you take your own cue. And then um, if you want to do another one, just give us a beat in between so that we could cut and then you can start over. Okay. Hi, this is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President for the African American Film Critics Association. We've just wrapped up an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director Tanya Pinkins and cinematographer Arthur Jaffa for Tanya's exciting film, Red Pill, which will be featured at the Pan African Film Festival on February 28th. How's that? That, that was, was perfect. That as an, an outro, um, can we get one that is the intro for the panel? Um, so okay. not in the past tense, but like you're kicking it off at the very top. Okay. Also, wait a minute, one, one more thing. Also, whenever you say the festival, say February 28th through March 14th. So okay. um, you it. might have to do the other one over because her film is not going to be played on the 28th. Uh. That's the opening. It's going to be you can see it anytime between February 28th through March 14th. Okay. Okay. To March 14th. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hi, this is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President for the African American Film Critics Association. And we're about to sit down with actress, director, and producer, Tanya Pinkins, and also cinematographer, Arthur Jaffa, to talk about Tanya's new exciting film, Red Pill, which will be featured at the Pan-African Film Festival, February 28th through March the 14th. Okay. Yes, I think I think that was good. Um, and do you want to do the the outro version that you did before, where you talked about it in the past tense, um, as if you're wrapping up the session um, and uh, thanking them for participating and whatnot, and just giving those the range of dates instead of just uh, February twenty eighth. Okay. Thank you for participating. And uh, should I send them to the website to purchase tickets or something? You know what, we can do that yeah. in the, do you, Ms. Linda, you wanna do it here in the outro because they're already kind of in the session if they're listening, right? So would it make more sense in the drop? Oh yeah, in the drop, yeah, in the drop, not the outro, outro. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, okay. Okay, all right. <clears throat> We've just wrapped up an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director Tanya Pinkins and cinematographer Arthur Jaffa 
Okay, I need to start over. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Okay, wait a minute. Take a beat. Also, and- uh-huh. also, I wanted to add this. Add um, for Arthur Jaffa, he did Daughters of the Dust, which was a huge success. Mm-hmm. So you could say that too, because it was also okay. premiered in the Pan African Film Festival. And these people would know who he is based on that. Okay. Okay. Because it, it premiered several, I mean, we've showed it several times. Daughters of the Dust that premiered. Premier, okay. I don't know if we, if we say premiere, but was featured at Pan African Film Festival. Okay, that was featured. Okay. <clears throat> We've just wrapped up an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director, Tanya Pinkins, and cinematographer, Arthur Jaffer, who you probably know from Daughters of the Dust. And Daughters of the Dust was featured. I got to start over again. Daughters of the Dust, period. Yes, ma'am. And, and uh, Miss Kathy and Miss Linda, yes. um, because this is the outro and you guys have just finished up this lively conversation, um, do you think it should be more like, uh, you know, thank you, Tanya and Arthur, and then kind of say, you know, uh, doing the little bits that you have, you know, Arthur's film, uh, Daughters, of the, or Daughters of the Dust was featured in the festival before, and, you know, Tanya's current film, Red Pill, is fe- but you know what I mean, like tying it more to the present, because you just finished wrapping up, and this is kind of the summation of the session. Okay. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, thank you, it's um, much better, and thank you, Pan-African, thank you, Tanya, thank you, Arthur, and then a little bit of credits about them, and then that's it. Okay. I'm, I'm also getting ready to hop off you guys because I have another one um, to jump on. Thank you so much, Kathy. You were awesome. It Thank was you, wonderful. Nice. All right. And Melissa, as soon as you finish, uh, you hit me up, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me see. Arthur, also, you may know Arthur. No, you know Arthur's work. of the dust it was featured featured here Okay. <clears throat> okay, ready, Melissa? Yes, ma'am. You can take it whenever you're ready. Okay. We've just wrapped up an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director Tanya Pinkins and cinematographer Arthur Jaffa. Thank you, Tanya and Arthur. You know Arthur's work from The Daughters of the Dust that was featured here at the Pan African Film Festival. Tanya's exciting thriller, Red Pill, will be featured at the Pan-African Film Festival February 28th through March the 14th. Thank you for participating and please visit paff.org. Awesome. Oh, good, it works? Yes, ma'am, I think that works fine. And then, what we can do next is just do your drop for the festival and there we can you know say the festival dates there and just uh whatever you would like to say organically so you know using your words of um you but of course you know saying your name and title and just welcoming or inviting someone to uh join the festival and check out the films and and letting them know the dates of the festival okay let me because I have to read or I'll forget. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay. Just, you know, like, 
Hi, I'm Kathy Williamson with the African American Film Critics Association, and I invite you to join us uh, to uh, join us for this year's 2021 Pan African Film Festival, um, taking place February 28th through March 14th. To get your tickets and check out the lineup of great films, visit the website www.paff.org, or you know, just something like that. Okay to March 14th. Okay. The festival, da 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 da. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> this is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President of the African American Film Festival. Uh-oh, not festival, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> this is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President of the African American Film Critics Association. I want to invite you to come, blah, 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 blah. okay. Hmm, okay. This is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President of the African American Film Critics Association. Don't miss the 2021 Pan-African Film Festival, February 28th through March the 14th. To get your tickets and to find out the lineup, visit paff.org. Thank you, see you there. Perfect. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew the hard part would be that? The interview oh, no. was fantastic. Such great questions and uh, oh, dialogue back and forth. Yes, yes. Awesome. Oh. Well, um, I think that will do we have the, oh, would you mind doing um, just a drop to invite people to check out the panel discussion? Like we've done the festival, we've done the intro and outro to the session, but would you like to do just a tease for this uh, panel of encouraging okay. them to come? Is that okay? Yeah, I don't, let me I don't, see. Okay. Okay. Okay, now at the end when I'm inviting them, do I tell them to stay tuned or to, how can they find the, um, the panel? Um, I would say, um, check the schedule for these, because as I understand it, all of the panels will coincide with the screenings. Okay. So I would uh, say check for the schedule. For date and time. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> Ready. Hi, this is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President for the African American Film Critics Association. I want to invite you to attend an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director Tanya Pinkins and cinematographer Arthur Jaffe. Jaffe, Jaffa, Jaffa. Okay, over again. Hi, this is Kathy Williamson. I want to invite you to attend an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director Tanya Pinkins and cinematographer Arthur Jaffa. You know Arthur's work from the Daughters of the Dust that was featured here at the African American. Jesus Christ, this is hard, huh? <laughs> it happens right. to everyone. Oh my goodness. Okay, I think I'm rushing. Let me slow down. Okay. Hi, this is Kathy Williamson, West Coast Vice President for the African American Film Critics Association. I want to invite you to attend an exciting panel with actress, producer, and director Tanya Pinkins and cinematographer Arthur Jaffa. 
You know Arthur's work from Daughters of the Dust that was featured here at the Pan-African Film Festival. Tanya's exciting thriller, Red Pill, will be featured at the Pan-African Film Festival on February 28th through, the 20, through March 14th. For the date and time, please visit paff.org. Thank you. See you there. Perfect. Okay. Yes, I think that takes care of everything. Um, let me just check. Out. I just got a text from Linda. Let me just make sure we got everything she wanted. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, yes, I think that has us covered. So I think that'll do it for you. Thank you well, so Lisa, very much. It's been a pleasure to meet you and to work with you. Yes, ma'am. You as well. Let's turn my video back on so you're not talking to, to <laughs> just the text. <laughs> Okay. Well, appreciate it. I know you're busy, so you have a wonderful day. And thank you, thank you for all the work that you do. Oh, no problem. Thank you. It was an okay. honor. Have a okay. great one. Bye-bye. You too. Bye-bye.